Our next session, Modern South India. Rajmohan Gandhi in conversation with Nirmala Lakshman. Rajmohan Gandhi, a historian and biographer, divides his time between India and the United States, where he teaches at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His latest book is Modern South India, a history from the 17th century to our times. Other books by him include Understanding the Muslim Mind, Rajaji, A Life, Mohandas, The Man, His People, and His Empire, Punjab, A History from Aurangzeb to Mountbatten, Patel, A Life, and Understanding the Founding Fathers, an inquiry into the beginnings of the Republic. Dr. Nirmala Lakshman, formerly joint editor at The Hindu, is festival director and curator, The Hindu Lit for Life. She's a director of The Hindu Group of Publications and chairperson of the board of The Hindu Tamil. Author of an anthology of journalism, Writing a Nation, and a book on Chennai, Degree Coffee by the Yard, she is presently working on a book on the Tamils. Please welcome Raj Mohan Gandhi and Nirmala Lakshman, Modern South India. Good afternoon. It's an honor and privilege to be in conversation here with Professor Raj Mohan Gandhi, historian, biographer, former member of parliament, who has served as research professor at the Center of South Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and in the US, and apart from other academic positions that he, has hold, he holds, such as teaching political science and history at Michigan State University and two IITs. The author of an astonishing range of more than 20 prize-winning biographies and histories, which include, among others, Prince of Gujarat, the story of Gopal Das Desai, several books on Mahatma Gandhi, on Gafar Khan, Sardar Patel, and Rajaji, and also a history of the Punjab, a work on understanding the Muslim mind, and a remarkable book that follows the trajectory of reconciliation and re revenge in a study of South Asian history. His latest book is Modern South India, a history from the 17th century to our times, and it's a masterpiece that has been described by a reviewer as a tour de force of modern South Indian history. Uh, I'd like to begin by uh, s saying that uh, you know, uh, Dr. Ra uh, Professor Raj Mohan has uh, spread his expertise over biography, history, and a range of other very, very thought-provoking subjects, including a very important uh, topic of our times, which is the study of revenge and reconciliation. I'd like to begin by asking him how he manages to handle all this, the, the decision to look at certain subjects and how long his research takes, and how does he decide which is a more important subject to begin with? Um, even though I've written a range of books, although the number is not quite 20, Nirmala, uh, I've written a fair number, but I only write one book at a time. And once I have decided on a subject, then, you know, that subject is decided. And this particular book I've been working on for four years. Uh, and so uh, it was not competing with any other books I was going to write. <laughs> so I was, yes. But, but perhaps uh, I, I shouldn't be asking a question that you should be asking, but, but maybe um, I should try and attempt an answer, why this book? Uh, for one thing, North India has needed to be educated about South India for a very long time. So this... <laughs> so this book was long overdue. As a follow-up question, can I ask you what makes this region distinctive? I don't want to say as opposed to North India, but what makes the South distinctive? Um, 
you have the oceans. The North does not have the oceans. <laughs> yes, the North has the Himalayas, which is amazing. But the South has, a motion, has the oceans, and therefore both the eastern part of South India and the western part of South India, they have been aware of the whole world continuously for centuries. And this shows up in, in the trade that uh, South India has had, in the contacts with your ancient kingdoms had with uh, countries of, of Asia, the trade that both the Coromandel Coast and the Malabar Coast have had with uh, the Middle East for a very long time. So the oceans and, and what uh, the implications of that is one very important part. Um, and then if it's the well-known, although sometimes disputed, but perhaps well-established and generally accepted fact that all the, uh, or some of the major South Indian languages, I'm not speaking about the tribal languages, but the main non-tribal South Indian languages uh, are all of, all of them linked to the Dravidian origin. And that makes for an incredible linguistic affinity. Uh, we, and very, very distinct from uh, the language groups in, in, in other parts of India. So that's... Uh, uh, and then, and, and this is uh, perhaps the most interesting point. Uh, I don't say the South has practiced the notion that there should be a single and an equal community of people of all kinds. No, I don't say the South has practiced it. I don't say that the South of India has demonstrated to the rest of India or to the world that there is a wonderfully equal and single, united community. But the notion that there should be a single community of equality has existed in the South for a very, very long time. And this notion has been articulated again and again over the centuries. Um, you know, one of the relatively more recent articulation was by this um, Telugu playwright and poet, Gurujad Apparao. Um, uh, so w when, he when he said something like this, this is not in his famous play, Kanya Shulkam, or Bride Price, but elsewhere he has written, never does land mean clay and sand, the people the people, they are the land. Now, what a, what a tremendous notion that a nation or a land is not the physical territory. Yes, the mountains may be beautiful, the rivers may be wonderful, the oceans may be amazing, but it's the people that constitute the land, and he speaks of the people. And so that notion of, uh, of an equal, that aspiration of an equal and united people is the South's contribution to the rest of India. Um, I um, absolutely agree with you, but, and certainly the notions of social justice, equality, all that was very uh, important to the people from this region. But uh, reading through your history, I found that a lot of issues in the 17th and 18th century predominantly spoke about caste affiliations and caste groups, including the polygars who were encouraged by, uh, post Vijayanagara by the various, their overlords. And I think that seemed to dominate more than uh, linguistic affiliations, which came much later. The question of dealing with linguistic uh, identities were, uh, came later and again subsided after the reorganization of states. But the caste affiliations, did they interfere with this notion that you have just described this idea of, uh, you know, social justice and uh, the common spirit that South Indians seem to have shared? Oh, there's no doubt that caste affiliations, caste inequalities, caste confrontations uh, uh, stood in opposition to this amazing idea which was also born and articulated in the South. So this story that I have attempted to write here starts, as you pointed out, in the 17th century. Uh, you know, whenever uh, people uh, speak of South India, there is the, the suggestion of the ancient temples, the ancient literature, the ancient poetry, uh, but my story only starts from the 17th century. It does not deal with the earlier period. The Vijayanagar Empire has ended, and the Europeans have started to come, and as you point out, 
uh, the polygars are very active in different parts of southern India. There are many numerous uh, chiefs in different parts. Uh, it's an unstable situation. In 1616 or 1617, according to a Jesuit priest who was in this area, uh, there was a war near Trichy. According to this man Baradas, over one million soldiers took part in that war. Can you imagine? Now, he may have exaggerated, he may, not, he may have miscalculated, but even if only 100,000 people took part in that war, that's a tremendous loss of blood and of, uh, of grain. So uh, the South India that the Europeans, when they came in the 17th century, 18th century, found was a deeply divided area with various Indian chiefs, native, native chiefs, sometimes called polygars, uh, fighting with each other, finding allies among the Europeans who had come. Uh, so it, it was that kind of situation. And very soon, as you have pointed out, caste also began to play a part. And I, I've given an instance here of how in the 17th century, in the 16th something, there was a conversation among uh, uh, British uh, um, uh, employees or officers of the East India Company about how caste divisions in South India could be useful for British expansion. Yes. There's another aspect yeah. that you write about, and you said um, in the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, you quoted uh, a scholar saying that India was the go-to place for bold spirits seeking a fortune. You speak of the spectacular nature of Indian exports of textiles, spices, and pearls, and uh, uh, saying that more than something like the quarter of the world's wealth was in this region, India as a whole, and, and definitely in South India. Uh, what do you think of why was this was, was the caste and were, were the other the uh, squabbles among chieftains uh, the reason why uh, there was an erosion of the wealth of India and uh, you know the whole you also mentioned that the employ there was not an employer employee relationship between traders and those who were manufacturing and producing these goods what caused the shift to uh, an unequal relationship. Uh, you know, before our uh, conversation began, there was this amazing talk by Venkatesh Ramakrishna. Yeah. And through, in his uh, graphs and charts, he showed how India was, in China, were the richest countries in the 17th century and even in the 18th century. And then, uh, among other things, the Industrial Revolution in the Western world helped Britain and Europe, and later on the United States, uh, to move up. So. Uh, uh, one reason for the subsequent deterioration in the Indi South Indian economy and the rest of the, uh, of the economy in the rest of India uh, was, of course, the decline of the textile industry here, the, uh, the importation of uh, cotton textiles from Britain, Lancashire. And this, uh, there was this very interesting French priest, Abbe Dubois, whom I quote a lot, uh, who wrote this book. He lived in India in 1770s, 80s, and until 1820s, 30s, for a long time in southern India. And he, in his own uh, spell in India, saw the decline in uh, cotton textiles and the huge increase in, in unemployment and the huge increase in poverty. Uh, and the, uh, I quote another uh, group of scholars, uh, not scholars, but surveyors, uh, who were from the Madras army, who in the 1840s, uh, went to different parts of southern India uh, and, and uh, studied the economy, and they also confirmed this precipitous decline in the economy, very largely due to the decay of the textile industry and loom weavers. So uh, that was uh, a major element uh, in the... Uh, so caste played a part, uh, but I think in the decline of uh, the economy of the South, it was more the, uh, on the one hand, the uh, removal of money from, collected from the farmers and sent to England as, as uh, taxes to the East India Company, and the great decline uh, in the cotton textile industry because of the importation of uh, Lancashire textiles. 
Was there a difference, you talk about the four states, uh, was there a difference in the economic decline as, that was observable over the, la the 200 years that you, the first 200 years that you write about? Were some regions better off than the others? Because uh, we, uh, you lead to the, you know, the famine that was not reported, the famine that the British uh, treated very uh, cruelly. And I was wondering if there's a difference between the states that dealt with the, uh, uh, different had different kinds of economy or groups that uh, dealt with it with uh, you know the single rulers were some people better off than the others uh, to be honest uh, nirmala that is not something that i have studied in great detail but now that since you mentioned the the, uh, the famine I, I do want to quote one or two things from from uh, this book if if i may um, After Tipu was defeated and killed in 1799, uh, the British uh, sent a man called Fran Francis Buchanan, also known as Francis Hamilton, mainly uh, in the Tamil area and in the Karnataka area. He did not visit the Telugu areas or Kerala. But during his tour, this is 1800, He's collecting information he's in very great detail. Uh, then he finds uh, somewhere near Chikballapur, a place called Bomma Samudram, he finds uh, the horrors of famine. And, and this was a, a famine that had taken place some years earlier. And it was a famine that was accentuated, aggravated by the attempts by Cornwallis this is before Tipu was killed, some years before that. This was in a conflict that Tipu had won and Cornwallis was defeated. He was the governor general. Um, so this is what um, uh, Buchanan writes. The horrors of famine were never so severely felt here as during the invasion of Lord Cornwallis when the country was being attacked on all sides and penetrated in every direction by hostile armies or by defending ones little less destructive, one half at least of the inhabitants perished of absolute want. One half of the population of that area had died in this famine seven years previous to what Buchanan records. And I mention this, and this is uh, my sentence. It is a sober truth of history writing that a phrase like this is located, inserted, italicized, and quietly abandoned, because I also then proceed to something else. So, so many famines occur, but very sadly, uh, even people who are affected by this discovery are not always able to pursue that story and find out more about the nature of the suffering and how it was dealt with, and other, other matters take precedent. This is true of journalism today, it is true of history writing. It is something we have to acknowledge. Uh, did you think that the lack of communication between people and uh, the deliberate uh, uh, eschewing of uh, great problems like famines was the reason by which, for which, for, for which they were perpetuated? The British didn't care, and there was no, I mean, active journalism then. Perhaps there were pamphlets, and perhaps local communities spoke about this. But did you think that that was one reason why which, I mean, famine is uh, something that we deal with, it, we try to deal with rather quickly, more quicker this, uh, in this century than we did then? Uh, I think we, we should certainly hold the British responsible for <clears throat> a lack of attention, lack of study, lack of uh, conclusions on what to do next time a famine occurs. But I don't think we can all only uh, hold the British responsible. I think all of us have to figure out, as I myself, you know, when I couldn't find enough information about that and I moved on to other matters, uh, this was an acknowledgement of a universal weakness amongst all of us, even today. So I think we should absorb that and not be satisfied merely by saying the British were there. 
um, to move on to um, uh, some more detail in the book, from the book. You have an array of uh, remarkable characters that you write about in the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, such as Marthanda Varma of Kerala, the Mobilis and the Vijayanagaram rulers, and later people like that remarkable Yusuf Khan, who is in the, a soldier with the British, and uh, later on uh, uh, tried to re represent himself as the heir to the Madurai Nayaks, to the Hindu Nayaks. Uh, this is an astonishing detail, and I just wondered how did you choose certain stories to tell, and um, what uh, informed your choices? So as I was researching and studying, and by the way, I should also make, uh, uh, express my great debt to so many historians <coughs> whose expertise and knowledge I tapped. I did go to many archives. I did study a great number of documents, which I listed at the end of this book. But I also had the good fortune of interviewing people in the Tamil areas, the Telugu areas, Kannada areas, Malayalam areas, who had studied their regions for a very long time and discovered from them what they felt were the significant events, what they felt were the interesting personalities. I think here I, should, I would also like to add that in writing this history, my aim was not to identify heroes and villains. My aim was not to search for people who could be blamed for what went wrong, or for some people who could be idolized as, as exceptional heroes. My aim was to try and recapture reality to the extent I could. What was the 17th century like? What was the 18th century like? What was the 19th century like? And what was the 20th century like? In all the four principal areas, culturally speaking, of the South, the Tamil area, Telugu area, Kannada area, and, and Malayalam area. And uh, I, I should mention this also, that uh, having spent most of my life outside the South, uh, I was possibly, possibly spared from an excessive loyalty to one particular part of the South. <laughs> and so I, and I consciously tried, of course, so when I was preparing my uh, history, I was moving forward in time, and I was always moving sideways in space. I was moving from Kerala to Tamil Nadu, from Andhra to Karnataka, and so forth, while also moving forward in time. And therefore, uh, yes, uh, the need to, to tell stories of all the four principal regions was always on my mind as I was selecting the personalities and the issues to write about. Um, in choosing certain personalities, such as uh, uh, talking about, let's say, Haider and uh, Tipu Sultan, you have, just by highlighting the reality of history, uh, you know, sort of uh, put paid to notions that uh, the, the current administrations have about people like Tipu Sultan, you know, making them into bogies. And, you know, there was a furor uh, caused recently by... Uh, uh, where there was a celebration of Tipu in Bangalore, in Karnataka, I think there was uh, some kind of a revisionist uh, uh, approach to uh, the celebrations. And I think there was some attempt by certain forces to um, undo that. No, and in that sense, I think a lot of the reading of this, uh, the facts in your book, rectify, if I may say so, the notions of who these people really are. Did you, uh, were you aware of the, uh, that, you know, do you think as a historian that, it's uh, your duty uh, to constantly put out these facts and uh, to curtail the prejudice that can be uh, fostered by certain uh, you know, elements in public life. Um, that's a very important question. But I have to say that my aim was not to identify current misrepresentations and try to correct them, no. My aim was to try and recall the times as faithfully as honestly as I could. I wanted to recall the Haider and Tipu period as honestly, truthfully as I could. I've also mentioned semi very negative aspects to Haider's rule and, and Tipu's rule. And those, those are very important aspects to be conscious of. And I have not hesitated to mention them because I wanted to recapture those times. But I also wanted people to know that Tipu uh, by the way, between them, Haider and Tipu gave 38 years of stable rule to a very large territory then known as the Mysore uh, Territory, Mysore State. 
38 years of stability and the economy developed, the administration was refined. Uh, but what is also worth noting is that the, when Tipu was uh, finally defeated and killed in May of 1799, it was a huge imperial event, which even the defeat in 1815 of Napoleon did not eclipse in British minds. Uh, the British at that time seemed to regard Tipu and Napoleon as their two great obstacles in the world. <laughs> this is worth noting. For years afterwards, British novelists, including Walter Scott and British artists, would pair the Corsican Napoleon and the Mysorean Tipu. And in April of 1800, in London, there was an enormous canvas, 21 feet high and 120 feet long, portraying the storming of Seringapatam, as they mentioned it, in London, done by a young artist called Robert Kerr Porter, which Londoners would flock to see over the following nine months. So this is how Tipu was imagined in London at the time. Um, to go on again to the British uh, celebration of getting India into their uh, pocket, so to speak. Uh, what is your view of um, uh, historians like, uh, writers like Sashi Tharoor who have very strongly condemned the depredation of British rule? And do you share uh, this, this uh, view that um, a lo lot of India's ills and the, you know, the, the, the movement towards uh, our own uh, the depletion of our resources and our economic uh, 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 life is largely because of the outcome of 200 years of colonial rule. Um, I don't want to uh, describe Shashi Tharoor's position in a sentence or two of my own. I think his books should be read uh, and you can discover what his views are. But yes, uh, he takes a very, very harsh view of uh, British rule, and uh, part of that harshness is justified, or, or much of that harshness may be justified. But I would say that in my study uh, of South India for 400, in the last 400 years, in, in which many British and many French and many Dutch, many Portuguese, but mainly many British also feature, also helped me to discover some astonishingly uh, helpful Englishmen, Scotsmen, Welsh, Irish people who were in, in India, uh, and some of them also feature in this book. So uh, I think uh, it's, it would be, in my opinion, historically inaccurate and wrong uh, to say that... Uh, uh, by the way, I, one thing to learn about the past is that since we cannot change the past, above all, we must accept it. We may lament it, we may regret it. It happened. We may not have liked it, but it happened. Uh, we can learn lessons from it, uh, how it might have been prevented. Uh, when Tipu was fighting, there were the Marathas, there was the Nizam in Hyderabad, there was the Hindu Maharaja of Travancore, there was the Nawab of uh, Arkadu, the Nawab of Karnati, Ar Arkot. These people were not willing to talk with one another, to unite to see how to prevent uh, European powers from gaining control over South India. That was a tremendous reality and a tremendous tragedy. But then they came. And among those who came, among those who, so they came as traders, and then they became partners and allies, and then they became rulers. Some of them also became scholars, and they created dictionaries. Uh, uh, young people, 15 or 16 when they first came out to, to, to India. Uh, and they immersed themselves in the, in, in the South Indian cultures and became scholars uh, and uh, understood the grammar of, of our South Indian languages. And then the Roche dictionaries, we owe a good deal to them. So, I mean, frankly, we wouldn't be having this discussion. I wouldn't be writing this book. We wouldn't be meeting in this hall in the city of Chennai had it not been also for these people. So I, they came, they did some horrible things, they also did some remar remarkably good things. Wonderful. <laughs>
Uh, to go back to an earlier point that you made about um, making sure that you exhibited no favoritism towards any one region of the South. Uh, I found, found it very remarkable that uh, with the legacy of both your grandfathers, Mahatma Gandhi and Rajaji, you maintained a very object, objective distance from uh, in telling their stories and their movements and their activities and their politics in South India. I mean, barring uh, which I thought was a very welcome, a few little welcome interludes where you speak about uh, Rajaji's, there was a little paragraph about how he uh, mentioned uh, he, I mean, doesn't name his wife, but he is poignant and he remembers her while he's in prison. And I thought that was a very lovely, touching bit. Did you refrain deliberately from uh, getting into any personal references and these things sort of es escaped you, regardless of your intent to hold back from them? Well, you know, it's absolutely true, and I've admitted it in my preface, that had it not been for my mother being who she was, I might not have written this book. Uh, so my mother was a Tamil lady, and I'm very proud of that fact. But yes, I did not want that fact to dictate what I was covering, what I was not covering. And yes, Rajaji does feature in this story. I think uh, anyone writing a history of Southern India over the last 300 years perhaps would have to write about Rajaji. Gandhi also features in this story because he also was an important element in this, how events unfolded in South India. But of course, so was Periyar. And Periyar also features as much as Rajaji does in this story, and rightly so. Um, but I, I think I, 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 I don't mind my uh, referring to, uh, uh, or rather reading a couple of sentences that you have referred to. Uh, when Rajaji was in prison from 1921 to 22, um, he wrote a prison diary, and some of you are familiar with it. Uh, and yes, his, his, he was uh, uh, still a very young man. Uh, his, uh, his, his wife had died uh, about 15 years prior to this, some, approximately 15 years before he was, he was arrested, or something like that. But this is what he writes, uh, and, and she had died very young with uh, leaving five children. And this is what Rajaji writes in his prison diary. One evening, the sweet music of the village Nagaswaram from some happy home in the hamlets lying outside the prison walls. You know, you're a prisoner, but you can still hear music from neighboring villages. The sweet music uh, from some happy home in the hamlets lying outside the prison walls brought with it such an irresistible rush of happy recollections, of happy youth, of joy and hope, that I had to check my mind from wandering into the garden of sweet flowers that yield only tears. And then he writes this. All that I shall say to my God is, if she is anywhere and is still subject to pleasure and pain, keep her happy and free from pain or sadness. So, yes, I, I wrote this. It is Rajaji's own recollection, but it's also the recollection of so many other prisoners at the time. Thousands of people who had to leave families and loved ones and often remain helpless while they were suffering or unhappy. It's, it's a lovely little um, anecdote. And um, I also found that a lot of this, <clears throat> the personal also protruded into the EVRCR relationship. And uh, Periyar and Rajaji, as you pointed out, were initially friends, then they were foes, but they continued after that to be lifelong friends. How much of that uh, did you think uh, Ha came from your own personal recollections of both of them and their relationship, because um, they both lived to a great age and had a great influence on, um, and Periyar subsequently had a great impact on Dravidian politics. So how much of that was from the research and the reading, and how much of it was you know, current knowledge that fed into your book? Um, I was aware, as anyone who studies that period uh, would be aware, that uh, both Periyar and Rajaji were very key players uh, in the story of the South. And I was present when Rajaji was being cremated. Uh, Periyar was in a wheelchair, and we were all seated at a somewhat lower ground, and then Periyar emerged, 
uh, and uh, his wheelchair rolled down a slight slope very rapidly. And he came and uh, he was extremely friendly to all of us who were uh, mourning the loss of, of Rajaji. And, I, and before that too, I was aware of the deep personal relationship between uh, Periyar and Rajaji. So, uh, so that personal recollection enriched uh, my study uh, of the political story of the time. And um, I think as a biographer, you've managed to, uh, well, you know, even your uh, biography of Rajaji, and you also wrote about Sardar Patel. Uh, how was the, the approach different since one was closer to you than the other? And of course, your work, your study of Mahatma Gandhi uh, is like your Sardar Patel bi biography. But Rajaji's uh, book was very different. It was. I mean, all of them are equally powerful. But did you, uh, uh, was there a consciously different approach when you studied the, uh, did the biography of these two very disparate but important national figures? Um, you know, when I'm working on a particular subject, I'm totally focused on that. So when I was writing my Patel biography, which I did 30 years ago, I was thinking of nothing else but how to capture Patel's life as faithfully, as accurately as I could. Uh, when I was doing my Rajaji biography, which I had done earlier, that was my aim. Um, incidentally, this very interesting committee that was set up, K. Santanam, T. Sadashivam, C. R. Narasimhan, Rajaji's son. These three asked me to write Rajaji's biography. And Santanam Mama, as I called him, said something which I was always grateful for. He said, we want you to do this, not only because you're Rajaji's grandson, because we know that you will also be willing to criticize him if necessary. <laughs> uh, so, yes, uh, I could not suppress my affection for the man. I could not suppress my affection for Vallabhai Patel, whom also I had the privilege of knowing. Um, but here, before I, so let, to give an example of uh, of what I'm willing to write and, and include. Here is this. Uh, so when Gandhiji was killed, uh, C.R. Rajaji said some very interesting and very moving things, which also I mentioned in this very briefly. Uh, but what Periyar said about Mahatma Gandhi, I also want to mention, yes. if you'll allow yeah. me. Is that okay? Uh, the killing had deeply affected Periyar too, who in an obituary suggested, and some of you may or may not be aware of this, he suggested at the time that India should be named Gandhi Nadu. <laughs> Yet, Periyar continued to criticize Gandhi's endorsement of Varnashrama Dharma. The view that Gandhi condoned only an idealized version of that goal or did so to retain caste Hindu goodwill, not to divide society hierarchically, that view did not impress Periyar. Three years after the murder, Periyar offered his analysis of Gandhi's Mahatma hood and assassination. Now I'm quoting him, and if some of you are unhappy about it, don't blame me. <laughs> the Brahmins, he wrote, made Gandhi a Mahatma because he said he believed in the Vedas, he believed in the epics and in Varnashrama Dharma. Then he, Periya writes, the Brahmins assassinated him, when he says the Brahmins assassinated him, well, not all Brahmins did. <laughs> a, a section in one part of India came together, a small section to kill him. Anyway, according to Periya, the Brahmins assassinated him because Gandhi said that Allah and Ram were the same, that it was not the privilege only of Brahmins to be educated, and that the mosques seized by force should be vacated and returned to Muslims. Wonderful. That's a great note to end on. I wondered if you would like to read some other passages that have, which you found that you, know, you would like the, uh, the, the audience here to share and the hope that they will be picking up your books at the bookstore. Is it is time for us I think there's another five minutes, and then we'll open ourselves to questions. Um, okay, what do I want to share here? I I, let me go back to an earlier period, which uh, 
since we mentioned, if there is time, I'm, I'm not looking at the, the clock, so uh, two, three minutes I will take. Uh, this is again back to the uh, early 19th century, 1800 and something. Uh, some of you are aware of this very remarkable uh, person called Charles Philip Brown. In the Telugu country, he's absolutely loved because he uh, not only wrote one of the earliest Telugu uh, English dictionaries, he also um, discovered the poet Vemana, who's a very famous poet in the Telugu country. Uh, largely, he had been forgotten uh, uh, by, by many, and he uh, traveled across the Telugu country and collected these poems and, and, and produced, printed them and preserved them. So he's a very deeply loved figure in the Telugu area. But he also wrote a very interesting book called Cyclic Tables of Hindu and Mohammedan Chronology Regarding the History of, History of the Telugu and the Kannadi Countries. So Europeans who arrived here, uh, looking at various stories and, and histories, uh, and given various dates according to different calendars, very complicated, confusing calendars. He tried to deal with that. And then he uh, writes this, that in every Hindu school, he's talking now about Chennai and Madras at the time, a 36-month cycle of months is daily repeated backwards and forwards, along with the names of the months. So there is no long-term calendar of centuries or quarter centuries. But in the schools here in Chennai at that time in 1815, 1820, a 36-month cycle of months is daily repeated in the schools backwards and forwards along with the names of the months. So this, this is now my comment. This suggests that elite educated South Indians of this time most of them from a Brahmin or a high non-Brahmin caste, as also their young sons, had an acute understanding of an immediate short period without, however, connecting that slice of time to earlier periods. So I make this comment. Possessing a clear sense of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, but not of the previous century or even the previous quarter century, they were left to imagine the more distant past through the prism of an elongated present. This may still be an unconscious part of the Indian thought process. So we, from an immediate past, we try to imagine a much more distant past. I think that's a wonderful way to end this conversation. Thank you very much for that for illuminating comments on the book. And I hope uh, it's available at the bookshop, so I hope people will pick it up after the session. Uh, are there any questions? So good afternoon, sir. Uh, yes. Where are you? Here, here. Direct in front. Okay. Yes, sir. So India is a multi-diverse country, and we are having a lot of regional history everywhere. So in the school curriculum, what must be the proportion of the national history and the regional history? Because each region must know their own history, but it is not even now. So what must be the pro proportion the students must learn, the regional history and the national history, so in the equal way? So how it, how it must be balanced in the school curriculum? Well, I don't know whether anyone will take seriously my response to your question. <laughs> uh, but but uh, you might take it, but uh, whether you have the implement to, uh, you have the capacity to implement any good suggestion, I don't know. Look. As far as I'm concerned, not only must any, every child be taught regional history, national history, she must also be taught world history. We, we are... <laughs> humanity is one. Uh, so, we, yes, we must with great love, with great devotion, with great at attention learn our own, uh, the history of our own clans, our own linguistic area of India, and if possible, of the world also. Thank you so much, Rajman Bhai and Nirmala. Now, in this very history of modern South Indian history, as you very rightly mentioned, 
the oceans, both east and west, being part of South India. Now, in this history, for example, how you have dealt with oceanic transactions with China, with East Asia, and in a comparative perspective, in a regional comparative perspective, as you know, people of Odisha and Bengal, yes. we are in deep connection with East Asia. Yes. And the point is, both methodological and substantive historical point is, that even the history of South India, does it not involve an indispensable entanglement with the North? So therefore, my query is that methodologically, the very practice of South India also needs to be understood in its historical and that contemporaneous entanglement with North India. Absolutely right. And these entanglements with Eastern India and North India and across the seas with China, these are all questions that arise. So this book has lots of information and it has so many aspects that it does not cover and which of course must be covered. But questions like, like these inevitably arise and are absolutely important to recognize. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Uh, you, you mentioned about uh, Peria's opinion about Gandhiji and his, uh, his continuing defense of Varnashram, which he opposed. According to Rajmo Ramchandar uh, Guha, who's written a biography of Gandhiji recently, uh, and I talked to him personally at an interaction, he said in his later life, Gandhiji gave up Varnashram, and in fact, uh, uh, repudiated the idea of caste system. Now, I want to know what really happened. Did Gandhiji keep on taking the position that Varnashram is integral part of Hinduism, so should not be abandoned, or he gave it up completely? Thank you. From my understanding, Gandhiji referred to Varnashrama Dharma only as a theoretical concept. He always said that it does not exist in practice. The Varnashram Dharma that Gandhiji defined According to him, that idealized version did not exist in society. Uh, in my understanding, uh, his defense of the theory of a, of a, of a perfectly um, equal Varnashram Dharma society uh, was Gandhi's way of giving a signal to all the caste Hindus that I am not against you. Your interests are also my interests. Uh, but in later life, he, in the last, Ramachandra Goha is absolutely right. In the last 15 or 20 years of his life, he, he hardly ever referred to that. And he certainly said that he wanted intercaste marriages to take place. He, from the beginning, he was for equality. But by the way, this is an important question. But Gandhi and his attitude to caste is not the subject of this book. I've written about it elsewhere also. Excuse me. Question. I have a question here. Uh, you said the British had exploited, if I understand right, the farmers. Who else did they exploit and who were the good Britishers at that time towards Indians? Uh, quite a few of them are in this book. Uh, when I said that they were helpful, it does not mean that their life was selflessly devoted to the people of India. Uh, they did some useful things which we are still benefiting from. I mentioned this man Charles Philip Brown, who translated uh, the poet Vemana, uh, and composed the dictionaries, and there were other people like that. So, yes, British rule, uh, creating this notion of a, of a superior class of people, and then the rest were inferior, was a very great tragedy. Uh, but then, we too in our society had this rule of a superior class of people and some inferior class of people, and that too was a great tragedy. Um, so I think I, if you have the time and the interest, and if you can go, go through this book, you will find the names of several British people who, apart from being involved in the imperial enterprise, also contributed usefully to, to life here. I have one question. As a historian, what is your perspective about the impact of period in the social development of southern part, particularly Tamil Nadu? Uh, well, Periyar had a huge impact. Um, 
when he said that women must be respected as equals, uh, he pursued that goal with a passion that very few people pursued at the time. And also in terms of the equality of all human beings all over the world. Uh, so those are very, very great contributions that Periyar has made and the impact of that continues to be felt. Thank you, thank you very much. Is there anybody in the balcony who has a question but because we sometimes um, overlook questions from there. So is there anybody there who has a question? I just want to see if there's anybody up. Okay, fine. Please go ahead. Sir, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, there has been a book written by a British author in the early part of the 19th century on the castes and tribes of South India, running into eight volumes. Sarva was referring to C.V. Brown's contribution for the Telugu language. Like that on one side, was uh, this scholar commissioned by the British to exploit the caste and tribes of South India? Or was it a mere scholarly exercise, a social, uh, I mean, research? Um, you know, here I am reminded of something that a very interesting Muslim leader of the North once said when he was told the British Empire is built on the basis of divide and rule, divide and rule, divide and rule. He said, the truth is, we divide and they rule. <laughs> are we not interested in castes and tribes? We are. Every day, every five minutes, we have instances of, of that deep involvement in our caste, our clan, our tribe. And if some British scholars enumerated the castes and tribes with great patience and great deliberation, uh, with great research and effort, uh, whatever might have been the motives, that, in, that information is useful. We can, we can respect the distinctiveness of each group, each clan, each family, each caste, each class, each linguistic group. That does not mean that we should dislike the neighboring caste or the other caste. And if we can keep the notion of equality, that there is no higher group or lower group, but there are distinctivenesses, we can welcome those differences and, and uh, we can welcome all the books that spell out the castes and tribes and still have the notion both of equality and of friendship with all castes. There's uh, somebody from the balcony with a mic, Could so I? please go ahead. Hello. Yes. Um, this goes back to your uh, question about uh, the good that the British, some British did in India. And uh, today we have a new term. In any history of war and conquest, there's always uh, the negatives are passed off as collateral damage. Uh, wouldn't that be true of collateral gain too? when we are uh, so quick to dismiss collateral damage in war, why are we so eager, I mean, for a lot, for a lot of uh, British apologists, why are we so eager to glorify collateral gain? This was not in the interest of the Indian people. It was always in the interest of the British people that they, you know, good things happen. I, it was all about conquest. Why do we then, uh, why are we so apologetic about it? And why do we accept it so easily? Um, you know, um, Gandhi was, uh, I'll answer your question indirectly, a uh, very remarkable African-American leader from Washington, D.C. called Stuart Nelson met Gandhiji in 46, for, I don't know, I, I heard you, but I couldn't see where you are. Okay, thank you. So this Stuart Nelson asked Gandhiji in 46, 47, you have been teaching non-violence to Indians for 30 years. Why is there so much violence today in India? Uh, he was referring to the then Hindu-Muslim fight in Bihar, in Bengal. Many people were killed. This is before the great killings of the summer of 47. So Gandhi's reply was like this. I have tried to say to India two things. 
fear not and hate not. <coughs> fear not and hate not. They accepted the fear not idea. But they did not accept the hate not idea. And then Gandhi said, we hated the British, many of us, and when the British were leaving, we, be, we were very comfortable hating one another, Hindus hating Muslims, Muslims hating Hindus. So the British did terrible things, other people have done terrible things. We have done terrible things also to one another. But I think if we remember only the bad things people did, and if we can allow our memories to turn to bitterness and to hatred, whether it is between white and brown, or Hindu and Muslim, Dalit and upper caste, hatred is hatred, ill will is ill will, and we will never build a new world on ill will and hatred. So, one last question. Are we being discriminated by the NAT? Uh, allocation of seats was decided by a constituent assembly where there were a great many South Indians also. And uh, so all I can say is that all parts of India feel discriminated against when it comes to what percentage of seats they have. The question that I ask in this book, by the way, which has not come up in the conversation, why has the South been reluctant to assume All India leadership? Uh, the South has produced outstanding women and men in so many fields. And uh, unbelievable things have been done in so many areas by amazing South Indian uh, men and women. But why has the South been hesitant, shy, cautious, about saying uh, we need big changes in India and we from the South are prepared to lead all of India. So, yeah. Thank you very much and this concludes the session. If anybody wants to speak to him privately, he'll be available at book signing. So Rajmohanji, thank you very much. <laughs>